Welcome to Bits and Bobs. The show where we bring you tabletop gaming news and entertainment from around the globe. So grab a nice coffee and sit back. And let us welcome you to our table. Hi, my name is Emma Larkins. I'm a board game designer, creator of And Then We Died, Heart Catchers, and Abandon All Artichokes. Today I'm excited to talk about something near and dear to my heart, which is game feel. So what is game feel? It's a little hard for me to describe, honestly. It's been something that I've been workshopping and working on to really come up with a great definition. Uh, the best I've come up with so far is game feel is the psychological and emotional experience that you have while you're playing a game. So for example, do you feel uh, angry during the game at any point? Do you feel upset or sad? Uh, is your heart pounding with excitement or anxiety as you're playing the game? Is there a lot of tension? Or on the flip side, does the game feel smooth and even and relaxing? So. It's great to use a couple of examples here to help to explain a little bit more what game feel is. So Rhino Hero. It's a game where you have a little rhino meeple and you're stacking cards getting higher and higher and eventually the whole pile is going to fall over. So every time your hand is shaking as you place the next card, you feel uh, a lot of tension there, right? Compare it to a game like Takedo, where you're going on a journey across the Japanese countryside it's very smooth, very even, relaxed, you're painting pictures, you're going in hot springs. Uh, so there's just two different examples of game feel. There's a lot of things that contribute to game feel. You know, how competitive or cooperative is a game? Uh, how much thinking goes into your individual actions? How many choices do you have? Some games feel very different if you're playing them for the first time versus if you've played them many times before. So there's a lot of things that go into it. Mechanics and theme can feed into game feel, but they are not essentially game feel. And why this is so important to me is I feel it's something that's under discussed in game design. I think we talk a lot about mechanics, about theme, about winning, losing strategy in board game designs, but not as much about, you know, how will kids feel playing this game? How will adults feel playing this game? How will newcomers and experienced gamers feel playing this game? What is the experience that they're going to have in the middle of this game? Uh, and the experience curve as well. What do players feel at the beginning of the game versus what do they feel at the end of the game? There's so much that goes into that that determines whether a game is satisfying, whether it's fun, whether it's a good experience for the people playing the game. And most of the time now I've played so many games at this point, hundreds and hundreds of games and many prototypes. And the more I play games, the more I'm really looking for new experiences and new feelings. And that doesn't always come across in reviews and videos about the game. It's usually how to play, but you don't communicate the feelings and experience as much. And I think especially for people who are newer to games, they're kind of, that's how they experience games. Before they know the language of mechanics and theme, they speak of it in terms of feeling. I was stressed, I was excited, uh, I was having a lot of fun, I was not having a lot of fun, and all these are feeling words. So I think this is something I would love to see discussed more in board game design. And, you know, just love to have more conversations about it and find more language to discuss this topic. Hi, everyone. It's Michelle. I am going to be talking about my favorite storytelling game, one from 2013 called CV. It is by, I don't even really know what this publisher makes anymore, but it is a sort of tableau builder game. You have these sort of dice that give you resources to spend in the game and they allow you to sort of create situations where you have life experiences. Um, you start off the game with things for your, from your childhood. Like, so for example, um, there's a piggy bank card and it gives you one money resource to, to use on whatever 
is in the market at, at the moment when you're playing on your turn. You go through different phases in your life, like young adulthood, adulthood, and then old age. So some of the things that you might run into when you're a young adult is like, you know, like an internship or something. And that will cost some amount of resources, like most everything in your life, you have some kind of life circumstances that happened before you got to that point to be able to do the thing. So for example, the intern card requires that you have some amount of, I believe that is, ah yes, good luck, um, some amount of uh, knowledge, because obviously you need to have some kind of knowledge to get the internship, and then some amount of health. Health in this game is sort of like a generic, like overall well-being attribute, I guess. And then that will get you um, a little bit of a relationship boost. And then obviously it is a paid internship. Thankfully, I've had my share of um, <laughs> unpaid internships, but this one looks like it's paid. And so how this works is that you kind of have these different areas that you have to focus on. And you can really only do one thing at a time. Like, so for example, the internship card is a sort of like occupational type of category. You can't do more than one occupation at a time. And so throughout the game, you have to make decisions on whether or not you want to continue the internship. The reason why you might not want to do this is that you get rewarded in the game at the end of the game for leaning into these different areas. So the more cards you have of say like occupation. So uh, you effectively did a lot of different or moved through a lot of different careers, things like that. Uh, then you get rewarded for leaning in and sort of specializing in different areas. If it's serving you well, uh, then you just continue on with it and that'll be the only card you have of that category. And then there are sort of life goals that you're, um, you get to choose to uh, commit to at the beginning of the game. So for example, there's one that's the activist, and the activist wants you to have pairs of these different types of uh, cards that represent like health and relationships and things that what the game is assuming is what an activist is about. So throughout the game, um, I've remembered having stories of like starting off with a career as a magician, and then suddenly certain things turned out such that I could just randomly become a CEO of a, of a company. <laughs> so it, it has this like fun um, progression of, you know, you have your starting resources from childhood and then based on what kinds of things you have in your tableau, you have different resources available to you. So, so yeah, that's why I love this game. And um, it definitely has stories to tell. Whether or not you remember those stories afterwards is, is something different. But while you're playing, it's, it's actually really, really funny to see what kinds of choices people make. One of the things I do as the Cardboard Kid is help make board games a bit less scary for non-gamers, although hopefully I help gamers as well. See this? Look at all this text on the back. Look at all of these cards. Look at all of these rules. If you've never played a board game, you might be like, uh, maybe we'll stick with what we know. Breaking down the game's goal and rules helps people get a feel even before they start. Pantone has 2 to 20 artists using prompts to quickly make famous characters using only color swatches. Once I've explained the gameplay, I wrap it up. Rush to create characters using only simple color swatch cards and guess the characters that others create. That's Pantone. The cool thing is that even truly complex games can be simplified and reimagined in a way that makes sense to you. A game like On Mars is incredibly complex, less hours and hours, and your brain will be burning from overuse. At the same time, what you're doing is rather simple. One to four players bring supplies and materials gained at the space station to Mars in order to grow your colony. Take actions in orbit to get what you need, and take actions on Mars to contribute more to humanity's first Martian colony. We had been putting off this game for a while, but gaming rules of the video helped us figure things out. If you have a game sitting on your shelf, set up the game before you start reading. As you're going through the rulebook, you can take a long look at the cards, bits, and board. Me and my dad learn better when we're doing things. Maybe you're like that too. Most important is to have faith in yourself. I believe in you. If you lose the first game, oh well. Have fun, ask questions, and use what you learned to help you when you try it again. If the game wasn't for you, no worries. 
There are tons of games about pretty much every subject in many different play styles. You'll find something that appeals to you. And when you find that perfect game and you're playing at a game cafe or convention, if you see me walking by, call me over. I'd love to learn it from you. Hey everyone. This is kind of a fun shot for me because what you're looking at behind me is actually what I look at when I'm filming every day. So welcome to the other side of my studio. Um, what I wanted to talk to you all about today was connections over the game table, particularly generational connections. In my family, there is a long-standing tradition of playing games no matter what age you are. So if you could lay tiles and count pips, you were in the regular dominoes game. We played bocce outside, and it didn't matter your age. What mattered is, you know, could you play, could you have a good time? And connections were formed that way. I wound up with great relationships with my grandparents, great aunts, all sorts of folks that were, you know, considerably older than myself because we connected through games. There were healthy rivalries, you know, and sometimes that would extend beyond the game table and become a little good-natured ribbing here or there about, you know, next time I'll get you sort of thing. But in addition to just being able to play the game and play the game well, the conversations that came up while we were playing a hand of cards or pushing chits across a board at each other. The same kind of thing happened generationally as I started playing games outside the house, whether it was at game stores or online or now at game conventions or with RPG groups. I've played with people that are considerably older than me and now that I'm in my 40s, I've played with people that are considerably younger than me and the connection that's brought about by games is something that really kind of morphs into something more. Usually, you know, friendship, understanding. I think by finding a commonality, in this case games, it goes a long way to bridging what we might see as differences. So reach out. It doesn't necessarily have to be your immediate family. I, I'm a firm believer that we make our own families, but it could be an elderly neighbor or it could be a young person involved in another hobby that you happen to have. I think you might be surprised and pleasantly to see just how much you wind up having in common with someone that maybe you wouldn't have considered a peer before. But I think games have the ability to make us all peers. And I think if you want to have an in-depth conversation with someone, one of the best ways to start is by rolling some dice and pushing some pawns across the table towards each other. Right now, in particular, with social distancing, it's hard for a lot of people, but particularly our elderly and young folks, because the way they've been making connections up until now isn't really available to them. So this might be a great time for you to teach your great aunt how to use Discord. So reach out. I'm a firm believer that there is a game for everyone, and everyone is a gamer. You just need to find what that is. Teach something new. Be taught something new. Is there a classic game you've never played before that maybe your Nona is fantastic at? Give it a try. Friendships that span decades just add to the rich tapestry of our lives, and games are there to bring that together. Have a great day. See you soon. Bye. Hey there, friends. What's up? It's me, Crystal Pisano of Board Game Blitz and the Dice Tower. So I wanted to come and tell you all a little bit of a secret. I have discovered the trick to determining who is a real gamer and who isn't. And you can tell just by looking at someone. So when you see somebody out in the street or at the grocery store, or at the gas station or wherever, you can tell if they're a real gamer or not just by looking at them. Do you wanna know what the secret is? I'm gonna tell you, okay? So you look at them and they are. Every single time, without a doubt, every single person you see is a real gamer. Okay, it was a little bit of a trick, but here's the deal. Everyone's a gamer. I know not everyone self-classifies as a gamer, but I think you would be hard pressed to find someone who does not have a game on their mobile device or a video game console or a computer with games on it. Everyone's a gamer. And I think we sometimes tend to inadvertently judge others based on the types of games that they play. And that could be board games or video games or any other type of games. And I think in addition to judging other people, sometimes we judge ourselves for the same things. I know I personally have looked at other people's game collections and thought, 
wow, they own a lot more games than I do, or they've played a whole lot more games in the Board Game Geek Top 100 than I have. Am I a real gamer? And I tell you definitively that I am. And if you've had any of those same doubts in your own head, I can tell you that you are too. So I think it's really important for all of us to stop judging the way ourselves and others game and just have fun playing games with ourselves if we are a solo gamer with others if we don't if we like other types of games video games board games any games they're all great and we're all honestly just having great experiences with them with the purpose of having fun and being social with other people a lot of the time and honestly that's just pretty great so next time you see a person walking down the street i can tell you they're a real gamer and so are you. Bye, everyone. I have a friend who likes dry arrows. The drier, the better. And then I have another friend who needs a lot of very calculating intrigue in their game. Whether it's something like the resistance or coup or murder in Hong Kong, Hong Kong deception. Murder in Hong Kong. Uh, they just really like being able to figure out who's lying and who may not be working according to their interest, but they can work with anyway. I have another friend who just will play very specific games. They like a lot of uh, combat, for instance. They like a lot of player interaction and conflict on the board, um, figuring out maneuvers and tactics with their cubes and placements and they really like battle systems. All of these friends have asked me at some point what kind of games I like, and I don't know what to tell them because they're just like, Monique, what kind of games do you like? And then they make fun of me for my game shelf, which has a lot of starting games because I tend to teach and introduce a lot of new people to gaming rather than trying to convince them to play some of my heavier games. And it just ended up that most of my collection was curated toward bringing people into the hobby rather than playing with people who are already established. And one friend just kind of turned to me and says, you know, I think you just like games. I don't think you really have a type. You just really love games. And I think that's probably the best way I've been able to sum up. So it's always been kind of a special kind of torture to be asked what kind of games I play because I love Feast for Odin, but I also really, really like Sushi Go Party and the way that my family lights up and gets really intense when we're playing role for it. I mean, I like games. I like people having fun. I love to see the player interactions between people. I love playing like the super dry strategy, combat heavy games with particular people when I see them start to light up and glow from like the inside out because they finally figured out how they're going to get to win this battle. Best moments ever. I love playing the entry games, even though I am a terrible liar, <laughs> because I love seeing that moment where people are just kind of calculating and they just kind of give you that look. You know, the one where they're really trying to figure you out, but they think they got just enough information to count on you depending on how you answer this one question or complete this one plot, then there's, you know, pushing cubes is fun. I'm constantly touching like bits and components and things like that. So that tends to be pretty prevalent in any game I play is just how much I'm going to fawn over the pieces, even the ugly ones. I will say I don't tend to go toward games that bring out the meanness uh, in people. Those just aren't for everyone, and that's totally fine. I just want to see people having fun. So I guess, long story short, I just love games. And if you're fun and you're having fun, I'm probably going to have fun with you. Put in the comments below what your favorite moments at the table are. Tell me what are those moments where people are, where you just like, oh, I love it when people do this, because those are the moments I live for. Games are just as much about the people as they are about the components and the boards themselves for me. I'm a little bit of an extrovert. See you next time. Bye!
Hey everyone, I am Monica and I'm from geeksagogo.com. I am an award-winning Filipino cosplayer it's from Chicago. You've probably seen me cosplay the Phoenix Monster from Cool Mini or Not's Rising Sun. So the Banner Spear character for Frosthaven from Cephalo Fair Games. For today's video, I am so excited to show you a couple of looks inspired by the board game Villainous. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sit closer and I know this is a bit much because my skin is not the best right now. Um, so that's okay. I mean, my skin's not perfect. I'm gonna grab my hand mirror and I'm going to put primer on my eyelids. Eyeshadow primer is really important when you're putting makeup on because this makes all of the colors pop in your eyelids. I think we need to get started with Queen of Hearts first. I think it's a little bit more simpler look for what I have planned. Now for Queen of Hearts, you know, looking at the character and looking at the card, the primary colors are red and black. A little bit of white, a little bit of gold. So we're gonna incorporate all of that in this eye area here. I'll grab a tiny brush and then I'm going to dip it to a white eyeshadow shade. So, and Put it right here. Let me go look for that pink color and apply. So next, I'm going to look for a red shade. So I'm going to go on ahead and apply that here. And again, you're just tapping to blend it in. And I'm going to sweep it a little bit at the top here. I just want to add a little bit of highlight up there. Grab another brush and kind of just blend that out. Let's go in and prepare that those lines for for your crown here. You're gonna grab a white eyeliner. For me, I need this a lot because not a lot of colors pop in my skin. And you draw three lines. You make your crown. You're actually gonna paint that gold. I am going to draw a little heart symbol right here. I'm going to go on ahead and clean this up a little bit with a white eyeliner. Now you want your line as close to the edge of your eyelid as much as possible. So here's here's an eyebrow brush. You dip it on a red eyeshadow. Slowly draw out your eyebrow. And just clean out those lines. All right, one eye done, one more to go. If we look back at Maleficent's character card, her colors are purple and green for the green flames for the dragon. It also has a little hint of indigo or blue in it, so I wanna incorporate all of that. This white matte liquid lipstick will actually act as a canvas. I have a lighter neon green color, so I'm gonna get started with that right in the inner corner of my eye. A little bit of a darker shade of neon green on that and just tap it in. Let's work on our purple shades. And with purple, I don't have to worry so much because this stuff sticks to my eyelid just fine. Like a darker shade of green for my crease. And try to work on the top of the two green shades here. So and don't worry if you're getting too close to your brow. We can always clean that up later if you don't like it that close. Hold here. So now I'm going to do silver and go right on top, close to my brow. So now going back in here with that dark purple color and this color purple, we're going to sweep that up. Okay, let me clean up under this eye here. Just add a pop of shimmer. And it's really important to have an eyeliner or eyeliner pencil that is fully loaded because mine, I think it's about to run out, <laughs> unfortunately. But that's okay. I have another one in here. Just do it slow and steady because this is not a race. Now I'm gonna finish the rest of my eyeliner and tight line the rest of this left eye. All right, I'm gonna go back and add a little bit more indigo under my eye here. I've completed my look with some black lipstick and some glitter gem stickers. Accentuate the designs that I've created and give it a little bit more um, villainy type of look, like an evil queen type of look. Which one of these two looks did you like the best? And of course, if you have any questions, you can reach me at Geeksagogo everywhere.